relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our teaching is God the Father, knowing the Father. Many people think that we have to turn to the New Testament, first of all, to discover this. But in this series on the Sword of the Spirit, I always show how the Old Testament teaching is the foundation for the New Testament teaching. However, we do know that many doctrines of the Bible are more fully developed in the New Testament because God's revelation is progressive. He didn't say everything he wanted to say all at once. That's why we have 66 books in the Bible written over a period of more than 1,400 years because God progressively began to reveal to us who he was and what he wanted to do in our lives. Now, other people say the God of the Old Testament is very different from the God of the New Testament. Not so. He is the same God. There is only one God. He is the God of both Testaments, Old Testament and New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, we come to know God through Jesus Christ. He is the Word of God. He is the one who reveals the heart of God. And it's interesting that when Jesus spoke about God, he spoke about God as Father. He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the revelation of who He is. And when we grasp that revelation and know that Jesus is Son, He can introduce us to His Father and we also become children of God. Not like Jesus, because Jesus shares the very nature of God. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. But this key understanding of the New Testament as God is Father shows us that He is Lord, He is King, and He is Creator and Savior. And what He creates, He has the right to rule and direct. And uh, Pro uh, Romans 9, verses 19 to 21, show us that the kingship of God comes out of his creative activity, or at least it's part of his creative activity. So, Romans 9, 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? Here we have the human argument against the sovereignty of God. If God is in control of everything, how can God who controls all things find fault in anything? How can he find fault in you if he's controlling you? If he doesn't want you to do what you're doing, why doesn't he stop you? Because he's the sovereign God. And if he is sovereign over everything, then how can he hold people responsible? And here we have that very basic philosophical problem. How can God be in control? How can he know the future? How can he be, pre be the God of predestination? and predetermine events, and predetermine actions, and control actions of free will agents. Now, there is no philosophy that can grasp that, and it shouldn't surprise us, because if we could explain the infinite nature of God with our puny minds and our paltry philosophies, then he would no longer be God. But I stress that because today there is a revival of this kind of free will philosophy that says because there is free will and we are free and morally responsible and God holds us accountable for our actions, therefore God cannot be in control of us. And because he cannot be in control of us, neither is he in control of the world or the events or the circumstances, only in some great sense, uh, distant and remote sense, does he control and through his ingenuity manages to engineer situations finally, in the end, to get his will done. And because philosophically, in, our, in today's society and in today's philosophical climate, it is totally anathema to think of any form of predeterminism in uh, philosophy. And, and people can't cope with it. And, and so they have this kind of democratic God who, who enters into some kind of open relationship with his creation is to say, well, we'll just see what the consensus is. And then you challenge them and say, but what about God's will? Is God's will going to be done? Is Christ going to return? Oh yes, eventually. He will come when he's finally managed to work it out. 
And what they're concerned about is this picture of God as being this cold, metaphysical iceberg that doesn't relate to his creation. Well, we have seen the teaching of the Bible that God is not only the transcendent one, the one who goes beyond his universe, he is also the immanent one, the one who is present and active in every part of his creation. And that teaching alone should allay the fears of those people. So instead of this great controlling, predetermined, despotic ruler, which uh, they feel some Christian theologians have put forward, they have now replaced him with this rather weak, but nevertheless highly uh, clever engineering manipulator who manipulates so things happen. He manipulates you around your free will so, so that he can finally get his will done. And frankly, God is not this cold, impassive, dominant controller. Neither is he this, this rather uh, uh, weak but nevertheless cunning manipulator. He's not that. He is neither of these things. He is the sovereign God of the universe who nevertheless has the power and ability to control the actions of free will agents without somehow compromising their accountability to him or their moral responsibility or indeed their very free will. God is that big, friends. Now, how does the Apostle Paul tackle those issues that I've just raised? He does it like this. He says, let me read the verse again, Romans 9, 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? Showing that God's will will be done. And that God, God's will is, is, is working. In other words, God works all things according to the purpose of his will, as it says in the book of Ephesians. That is not challenged. Paul doesn't turn around and say, well, you've got to understand this. God is trying very hard and he has a problem with you because of your gift of free will and, and he's struggling with this, but he'll get there in the end. He doesn't want to uh, compromise your free will, you see. And so he's lost control and handed control over to his free will agents. And his will is just one other will, a uh, strong will, but nevertheless, one other will amongst all these wills. He doesn't resolve the philosophical difficulty like that. How does, he, how does he resolve it? He goes on to say this in verse 20, and this must be the last word in all philosophizing, all speculating, all theorizing about this, and all tampering with the revelation of God in his holy book. Verse 20, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? That's how the Apostle Paul resolves it. He says, get your face in the dirt over this lot, mate. That's what he says, to put in theological language. In other words, we can't understand this. We certainly can't reply to God and say, let's argue with God over this one. Because God's will is sovereign and supreme. And we simply must bow to the revelation of God in the scripture that he is king, he is Lord, he is ruler, he is sovereign. But at the same time, we, are, we have free will, we are responsible for our actions and accountable to God in all things. And we must put these two truths together side by side and almost in the same breath as the Bible does on many, many occasions, we will never, never work them out. A picture of this I once heard, which seems, it pleases me very well. I don't know if you remember from school, <laughs> those of you who did geometry at school, what the definition of parallel lines are. Parallel lines are lines that remain the same distance apart and only meet at infinity. And so here we have two parallel truths that we must separate and keep apart in a very clear way, but they, are, and, but they must also go alongside each other. That you, whenever you have the one, you must also have the other, like two lines of the railway track. But at infinity they meet. And what we will discover when we reach eternity, when we come to heaven, 
we will begin to see how these two relate to each other. And in the meantime, we must hold to both. And that causes us a lot of philosophical problems, but so much the worse for our philosophy. We bow to the revelation of God. And uh, today, some Bible teachers are saying, no, 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 that's totally unacceptable because we live in a thinking environment and uh, we, we are going to put people off God unless we can make him intellectually respectable. And unless we can show that he is palatable to those whose palates are, are sensitive to the philosophies of the day. Let me tell you, the revelation of God has never been respectable as far as philosophy is concerned. And if in the early church, some of the early church fathers were overly influenced by Greek philosophy, let us not make their same mistake by allowing our thinking of God to be determined by this modern democratic philosophy that is governing many theologians. God is sovereign. He is Lord over everything. Not one thing happens, not one molecule, not one atom moves without the upholding power of the Lord Jesus Christ because by him and in him all things are held together. Not one decision is made other than that which God himself is sovereign over. And yet every decision is made. Every decision that is made is made within the context of free will and moral responsibility and accountability to God. Well, I've managed it, my friends. I've even gone deeper than the manual itself. And much what I've just said over the last five to ten minutes is not even here in the manual. But you've got that for nothing. It's extra. It's extra today for you. All right. God's kingship is also seen in many of the New Testament references to God's lordship, God's throne, general references to God's sovereignty. Let's have a look at that in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 24. I, I referred to this earlier, this verse. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. Here we have the Son handing the sovereignty and the, the government back to the Father. All right? And so that means the Father will have first handed it to the Son. And now the Son, when, when it's all dealt with, when every rebellious rule has been put down and, and uh, all the enemies have been made a footstool for the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, he hands it back to the Father. What's he talking about? He's talking about the actual hands-on governing authority of the universe. The sovereignty of the universe is given back to the Father. So it's speaking about God's sovereignty. God's majesty, that's another uh, phrase which describes kingship. Hebrews 1 verse 3, speaking about Jesus Christ, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Well, majesty on high is a roundabout way of speaking of God. And it's a, a very Hebrew-sounding way of doing it because the Jewish people didn't, use the name God. They certainly wouldn't use the divine name Yahweh. And so here we have the writers of the Hebrews referring to God as the majesty on high. 